Hello, I am Carol Wilkinson, and I want to welcome everyone to our program today, which we are calling Festival Founders Tell Their Story, a conversation about the origins and history of the Sebago Long Lake Music Festival. To introduce myself, I want to say that I have been a festival goer for over 30 years. So I have been out in the audience for a long time. And I was delighted to be become a co-facilitator of this program with my husband, Christopher, who will introduce himself after you all introduce yourselves. Let's begin with introductions of each participant who is here today. I will call on each of you. Homer Pence, please start us off. Okay, I'm Homer Pence, and uh, I was the uh, first music director of the festival, and in that position for a decade, for 10 years, I was one of five founders um, that contributed greatly to the start of the festival, and uh, those founders included Morris and Kay Knight, my late wife, Judith Pence, and Paul Boyer, um, a flutist. We were all colleagues. Uh, Judith had uh, left Ball State by that time and was a member of the Indianapolis Symphony, but uh, the five, the other four of us uh, remained at Ball State as faculty. We bought the property in Maine in 1968 and spent our first summer here uh, in 1969, a few years before the festival started. I guess that's enough to know about me now. My wife and I, and consequently our kids, are totally non-musically -music inclined, avid consumers, however. And uh, we're really delighted to be part of the uh, genesis of the Chamber Music Festival. I don't think I exaggerate a bit in saying that we, my wife and I were midwives to the birth of the uh, festival. We were shopping for a rug on Summit Hill Road above uh, Homer Pence's cottage on uh, Summit Hill Road in Harrison, Maine. And uh, we were trying to cast a production of Man of La Mancha in a Bridgeton uh, Amateur the uh, Theatrical Group. And I asked the uh, kids that we bought the rug from uh, whether they were interested in being spear carriers in our production. They said, no, they were moving too soon for that. But that if we needed some help, they knew some professional musicians at the bottom of the hill. And we should go talk to them about personnel for the, the pit orchestra. So completely cold, out of the blue, we called on Homer and Judy Pence Morris and Kay Knight and Paul Boyer in their cottage at the bottom of the hill and uh, struck sparks with Homer and Judy. And uh, they looked, looked at the, uh, at the uh, score and said they knew that and they could do that. And it happens that Homer's a bassoonist and his wife Judy was an oboist, which are two principal uh, instruments in the pit orchestra for Man of La Mancha. And so they signed up readily and Homer said, this won't be free because we're trying to put together a chamber music series. And uh, if you'd be willing to help us find the movers and shakers in town, we'd really appreciate it. And he said the very least we could do. So we talked with friends of ours. There was a nascent group called the Friends of Bridgeton who were uh, attempting to to cultivate cultural uh, endeavors in town. And uh, so we talked with them and that struck sparks and uh, they were very instrumental in getting it organized and never looked back. That's very good to know. And it's interesting, isn't it? That the, uh, the audience members were some of the most important catalysts for the creation of this festival. Very much so. Um, now, from that early work and the establishment of the festival, I believe, <clears throat> Stephen, you became a director 
for a period of time, or at least affiliated with the administration of the festival? No, I was a director from about the third year of its existence for quite a few years. And in fact, was treasurer for most of that time. Mm -hmm. And I jokingly say that uh, being the treasurer of the group was a very easy job because typically the treasury implies that there are funds and we essentially had none. It was very easy to balance the books because zero minus zero kept equaling zero and made the job very easy. That's very reassuring when you can count on that yeah. equation. Uh, but nonetheless, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, there, were, there were external funds provided, uh, at least for a time, from, the, among others, the Maine State Commission. It was a lifesaver, uh -huh. literally the lifeblood of the early days. Uh, we scraped the bottom of the barrel because uh, when it wasn't the Summit Hill players staffing the, uh, the concerts, uh, Homer had the quaint notion that we ought to pay these professionals a professional scale and it made life very exciting for the treasurer. Never got caught with a rubber check, however. Well, that was good. Did you cultivate donors yourself as part of your uh, engagement with the festival? We talked it up. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the real fundraising was the principal musicians, Homer and Judy and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kay and Morris and, and Paul. I see. Okay. Um, the other question is, as beyond being treasurer, um, did you have, take up any other uh, responsibilities for the festival on an ad hoc basis, perhaps? One of the uh, fringe benefits of playing for the Sebago Long Lake Region Chamber Music Festival was wondering where you were going to be spending the night while you were here. And it was implicit that a director would uh, host guests. Mm -hmm. And for instance, uh, wonderful young woman named Denise DiCario, who is a cellist, uh, sister-in-law of Laurie Kennedy. Uh, we hosted Denise several years, and I want to tell you that we hosted the Monises for a, a year or two. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you, were you among those who would reach out to your acquaintances and friends to arrange for lodging for other musicians? Oh, yes. We helped put the arm on the neighbors. Good, good. This is essential. And what I think is fascinating about your story, Stephen, is, again, and I mean this in all sincerity, the dedication of audience members, of those who delight in chamber music but are not performers, was obviously foundational to the establishment and the maintenance of this festival. You couldn't be more to the mark, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that we've seen in the audience for most of the 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Carol and I have been going for the last 30 plus years. Uh, so obviously, uh, junior members of the, uh, the audience. Um, do, are, do you have any other reflections on uh, the festival, its place in your life, the place in the community life? One of the striking things is watching the, uh, the core group of musicians spin their web and pull in their acquaintances from near and wide, near and far. Um, we had a lot of luck with cellists. Uh, we found a young man named Carter Bray, who is now first cello for, I forget which very- uh, I believe it's the New York Philharmonic. I believe it is the Phil. And uh, Carter moved on and we got a, another youngster named uh, Timothy Eddy. And Timothy hasn't made quite the impression that Carter Bray did, but he's gone on to great things. And it was really interesting to meet these mm -hmm. up and coming youngsters. Yeah. And uh, it was really, as I remarked, it was very interesting to watch the, uh, the core musicians reach out to their network of uh, academic musicians, mm -hmm. uh, symphony musicians mm -hmm. and so forth. And I think uh, a lot of the symphony uh, musicians were really eager to become part of a small endeavor like a, a chamber group. Yes, yes. And um, I note that that has continued uh, again and again. The uh, musicians have come from a variety of symphonies. It, it's curious, one of them whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, violinist, is from the Indianapolis Symphony. And of course, Homer Pence in his day 
was a member of the Indianapolis Symphony, I believe. Not by mistake, but you'd find somebody from Indianapolis. Right, right, indeed. It all comes together. Um, I'm Stephen Manis. I was one of the original participants in the first year of the festival in 1973. Um, I'm a pianist and my late wife, Frida. Uh, we participated at the invitation of Homer. And uh, later on, after Homer relinquished a directorship, uh, Frida and I uh, were directors for it was two or three years. And uh, I remained uh, a participant for the first 45 years of the festival. Hi, I'm Barbara Graustein. I joined, I came on uh, to be with the festival in 1986. Um, I was in the Portland Symphony at the time and uh, Lori and Jim had told me about all their move and where they were living. And Jim said, why don't you come to one of the concerts at the Bridgeton Chapel? And I never, so I did, and it, I was hooked immediately. So I was on the board um, from 1986 till now. I was co-president with Claire Knox in 1997. Um, and after that, I was treasurer for 10 or 15 years after um, Ted Nixon had had enough of being treasurer. And um, now I'm president. Just for a couple of years, I have been COVID hit. So I didn't have very much to do for a while, but now we're back having a fabulous 50th year. I came in 1977. I think it was the uh, three, four, five, six, the fifth year of the festival. And Homer had invited my then husband, Jim Kennedy, and I to, to come to the festival. And the, the way we knew about it was uh, we had met this lovely couple at a party in Buffalo where we played in the Buffalo Philharmonic and they were Stephen and Frieda Manis. We actually met them before, but we just got chatting a lot at that party. And we both realized that we spent time in Maine in the summer. And uh, my family, my siblings and husbands and wives, extended family had purchased a, a farm in Carthage, Maine in 1971, had been spending summers there, not knowing anything about the festival fairly nearby. So it was very convenient for us to come over and play. And, um, when Stephen and Frida had had the, the directorship for several years, they were feeling, and I think board members were feeling too, that it'd be very helpful to have directors who were connected to the main music community and here all, for all year round for meetings. So that's when Jim and I took over as co-music directors, um, which, which we did for 15 years. And then um, I became the um, solo music director in 2000 and I played in all of the festival concerts, every concert, not just one a season or something or two, every concert from 77 up through just recently when I, I've been sort of dwindling off my participation after giving up my directorship. Thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to our co-facilitator, Christopher Wilkinson, and he will take it from here. Yes, I am Christopher Wilkinson, Carol's husband, and like her, I've been attending performances at the festival for more than 30 years. And it's my role to lead the discussion of the history of the festival, how its succession of directors put programs together, invited musicians to participate, attracted audiences, and for many years reached out to the community with special programming, an important element of the festival's work. As you know, Homer Pence uh, is the founding father of the Sebago Long Lake Music Festival. And while he sketched out a bit of its prehistory a moment ago, I would like to invite him to give some more detail. I will give this away. Mr. Pence and the founders were from the state of Indiana, not necessarily by birth, but by profession. They were at the Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, in the music faculty. And it was from there that they made the trip to Western Maine. And I would like Homer, if you would be so kind as to begin again with your story of how you came to Harrison of all the towns in Maine, what spoke to you collectively about Harrison, Maine? Uh, it was really just a, 
chance, I suppose, uh, my wife Judith and Kay Knight, uh, two of the other founders, were uh, reading the real estate ads in the Saturday Review of Literature, Norman Cousins magazine. And we used to do that for fun, uh, especially the main ads, uh, all of which were in the several millions of dollars usually because they were on the coast or in uh, Bar Harbor or somewhere like that. But we did see this ad for uh, a farm with a house, a barn, uh, a sauna building, and it was uh, listed as 68 acres more or less, and it was $12,000. And that seemed uh, more in keeping with our salaries at the time. So um, with the Knights and my wife and I and Paul Boyer, we each put in 4,000 bucks and uh, uh, came up, saw the place, decided it would be a uh, pretty good buy, even though it was a long way from Indiana, but we bought it and uh, we're very fortunate. Um, I don't know how, whether any of you know the, uh, knew the late uh, Bruce Cogeshell, a lawyer with uh, Pierce Atwood, but uh, Bruce uh, took over the searching of the title and found that one I believe it was one fifteenth of the property was outstanding. There was not a valid title. He tracked the person down in New Hampshire. They had no idea that they had owned part of the property. They gladly signed a quit claim. And uh, so then we got title to the property. I think we didn't think about starting a music festival. We were really more interested in fishing and swimming and eating lobster and just enjoying the beautiful surroundings. The idea of the festival occurred later after we had spent a good deal of time refurbishing the house and restoring the barn and uh, knocking down the sauna, which the porcupines had pretty well destroyed before we got there. Um, but after three years, I guess, or four years, we thought we might do something, whether would be a school or just what we weren't sure, but we stumbled upon this idea uh, of possibly having a chamber music festival. Uh, we thought about doing it in our barn and that didn't seem very feasible. And then as I related a while ago, Steve Collins suggested our contact with um, Dick Goldsmith, the headmaster at Bridgeton Academy. And Goldie was very generous in offering us the chapel, the use of the chapel, free of charge, free of rent. And uh, I think he was a little skeptical that we would continue after a year, but, but he went ahead anyway. And uh, we had to put up the chairs for each concert. They just had folding chairs at the time. And we did that and we got started. And, we encouraged and invited our friends like Stephen and Frida, eventually Jim and Lori, and um, Ilona Combrink was an early uh, vocal um, contributor to the festival. So that's kind of how we got going, uh, more by chance than by careful planning of any sort, I think. I'm so glad that uh, we've continued for all of these years. Look there, there's the first program, 1973. Notice what it says at the top. It says first annual. And uh, you, I think you've heard my story about Clyde Sanborn, the printer of the program saying, are you sure you wanna put first annual on that? <laughs> he said, you might not be here next year. <laughs> and we said, well, let's take a chance. So. So we did, and here we are 50 years later. Now, obviously, Mr. Goldsmith, Headmaster Goldsmith was a major force, uh, made it possible to have a venue that worked. Uh, again, no criticism of the barn. I haven't seen it. I don't know, maybe it would have worked. But <laughs> it's not there anymore. <laughs> that would be an obstacle. Um, but yeah. 
what occurs to me is there were other elements of putting on a public concert or a series of public concerts uh, that required um, decisions and connections. And I was wondering if you could discuss briefly uh, some of the other hurdles that you face that you are able to overcome, perhaps not as easily as finding a venue, but in other dimensions of the festival's uh, development. Well, um, I have to give a great deal of credit to the musicians who participated in the early years. Steve will uh, verify that the pay was extremely low. I think we managed 50 bucks uh, for our guests. And those of us that participated from the five founders took nothing uh, in the way of pay for several years. So there was that question of raising money. There was always a question of publicity, raising an audience. Um, our publicity was helped greatly. When I sent the information and photos for the first festival to John Thornton at the main Sunday Telegram, he took an interest in us and uh, gave us some wonderful uh, publicity really and encouraged people to come. I don't know, I can't say how many people came from Portland or greater Portland, but we had uh, pretty pretty nice audiences considering. And of course, uh, Eula Shorey at the Bridgeton News was very helpful uh, in publicizing the festival. Um, we, we managed to draw a decent audience and we broke even financially um, that first year, um, which was something that was, we were very grateful for to say the least. Uh, we didn't make any money, but we didn't lose any money either. So then we came back the second year and gradually uh, we incorporated um, and managed to continue the festival under that corporate uh, cover, which I think we're still using probably very similar corporate papers. Barbara would know about that. Interesting, very interesting. Yes. Uh, I, I just I just wanted to mention that that first year, Homer, um, and you can correct me on this, it was, I think, four weeks, but each week had a different focus and you brought in outside groups, if I'm not mistaken. We had one outside group, the Red House Circus, um, Eric Labor, um, and several other colleagues from New York had purchased property. I've forgotten just where in Maine, not too far from here. Uh, Eric Labor was a well-known um, musician interested in early instruments and Renaissance music and that sort of thing. And the Red House Circus specialized in uh, early music, mostly Renaissance and early Baroque. They had both singers and instrumentalists. That was the group we brought in. Otherwise, uh, Stephen and Frida did one concert. Our group, uh, the founders, did another concert. Elona Combrink, accompanied by Barbara Briner, uh, one of the Ball State staff accompanists, um, gave a, a vocal concert in which we supplemented with instrumental music as well. And then the Red House Circus was the fourth and final concert. And they were very well known and, and popular and drew quite an audience. Okay. Um, when when um, the week we were there, if I'm not mistaken, there was a cellist from Ball State Sanders, I think was his name, or Saunders. Oh, Joe Sanders, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, Joe had been the, I think he was, had been the principal cellist in Indianapolis Symphony, then had gone to Chicago Symphony, and then was the contractor for Radio City Music Hall Orchestra, um, and then uh, was hired as the faculty cellist at, at Ball State. I, yeah. Joe did come out and play. I'd sort of forgotten just what he what he did. Laurie, you remember? 
I wanted to say that, um, well, I thought it was interesting on that first program, there was no violinist, but that was to change very quickly the next year. But I wanted to say that this first program, these first programs of, that Homer presented are just uh, inspirational programming. And they just include the great big word variety, which, which I think just has always uh, applied to this festival. And Alona Combrick, who play, did this whole recital, world known soprano, and had uh, Minotti, John Keller Minotti had written an opera uh, for her as a soprano title role. And that was done at New York City Opera. And I think she sang there. So, um, and, and Joe Saunders and all the people that Homer brought in were just absolutely first class musicians. And so I think that's a, just a very, a, a very good reason to believe that this festival was going, not going to be annual, is going to keep going. And that, that a lot of that had to do with the inspiration that Homer used, using local people, fine local people, just all the variety you could ask for. Just wanted to stick that in. <laughs> um, this Thank leads you. me to another question. And again, uh, <clears throat> the directors in turn will, <clears throat> I hope, weigh in on it. I've referred to it as the chicken and egg question, meaning which came first every season? The decision about the repertory to be performed or the encouragement of specific musicians, the invitations to certain musicians to come to the festival to perform, which was first, music or musicians? Steve, why don't you take a crack at that to start and then Lori can chip in her view. What, how, how did you and Frida Well, you know, hard, to, hard to remember, we, but, um, it was probably, uh, Christopher, it was probably somewhat a combination. I think uh, because of budget, there was limit to the number of musicians that would be hired in any one summer. And so, uh, and um, I think mostly the directors decided on the repertoire, but I mean, there was consultation with the musicians. Um, as I say, I don't remember exactly and, and Lori has done this more recently, so she might be able to speak to it. Um, and another matter, uh, Lori mentioned violinists, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, Homer, and you, you can confirm this, uh, one of the violinists who was a mainstay for many, many years was Paul Wolf. And the story, as I remember, it was that I think after that first year, uh, Paul was, coming up every summer since he was about five years Child. old, yeah. Terry a while, and that he came and approached you. He said, hey, I'm here anyway, and if you need the violinist. To, um, and as I say, Homer, you can confirm that or-, or No, that's, that. That, that's, that's correct. Paul had come to, the, and Doris had come to one of the concerts, but I didn't know Paul. But Joe Saunders knew Paul because of his uh, being a contractor in New York and said, oh yeah, he's, he's perfectly fine. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no, I, I had known Paul actually, uh, oh, it's a long history. I mean, I didn't know him well, except uh, he had been conducting, he conducted the Bronx Symphony. And when I was about 16, I actually performed uh, I think it was made up right. third concerto with him in, right. in the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, so there was a connection there. And then um, re remind us, uh, Homer, when you, you brought Eric. I think Eric came the second year also. Mm -hmm. I can't, yes. I'm not positive. Yes, uh, yes, Laurie? second year. Yep, second yeah. year. Eric uh, and I had worked together in the Indianapolis Symphony. Uh, he had come my second year in the orchestra as concert master and was there for really quite a few years. And we remained friends. We had played chamber music together in Indianapolis in a series there. And uh, then Eric became the head of the string department, I think at New England Conservatory. And I called Eric and he was, uh, as always gracious and glad to play and uh, he and Paul became friends I think at least for some years and uh, 
Um, so it was, we had two really superb violinists, um, none the first year and then riches the second year, I guess. Uh, just well, for the benefit of, of viewers, uh, Eric's last name? Rosenblith. And uh, if some of you may know that he and his wife, Carol, uh, ran a, a very nice uh, festival over at Freiburg Academy for several years. Uh, recent, that, that's been quite recent. Um, I don't know, Eric's been gone now for several years and they no longer have that festival, but mm -hmm. there was a connection there. Carol had been a Freiburg graduate by coincidence. Yeah. And I'll just, can I just add one thing? Um, so uh -huh. our summer home is in Freiburg, right across from the building where they had their, for the where they had their festival. The library. So huh? My parent, my mother, who was an accomplished pianist growing up in Illinois um, with uh -huh. all of us playing instruments, she and I would go to all their, they, we just walk across our, our the road to, the, huh? to their <laughs> concerts. So I got to know they, them. They were the last, nice concerts. Huh? Yeah, last few years that they were there in Freiburg. And Good. I'll just add that going <clears throat> going on with the, the, um, uh, the, great opportunity of having really, really fine uh, experienced instrumentalists. Ro Eric Rosen was, was right up there, um, having come from Vienna when he was a little boy and have, or when he was a young, young person, having studied with um, you know, one of the famous violinists of all times. And, uh, and then just, um, just having this huge, huge amount of energy experience and acceptance and uh and i came in and played with him you know he was probably 50, 40 years older than i was at the time and just just colleagues right from the start and and he was just a wonderful uh, uh kind of a kind of a glue that kept everybody enthused and wouldn't you say stephen it was always uh very oh, yeah. enthusiastic with a tremendous amount of knowledge he might have been playing the foray piano quartet you know for the hundredth time in his life but it was always new and just having people like that um just uh and that was, was all all due to the way the the way homer and his his colleagues got started i'm 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 sensing from the enthusiastic recollections that um and i don't mean this in any pejorative sense there was a, a it was therapeutic for folks, this particular group of folks to play together as opposed to orchestral jobs that might have dominated the rest of their professional activities in a year. Here was a chance to converse uh, with colleagues, with peers, to collectively decide about how a piece would be performed and to then reap the benefits of that collaboration in the performance. Would that be fair? Well, I think it's really just a way of life for people who love music, professional musicians, because most of us who had full-time orchestra jobs, you know, at that time, I mean, we had a string quartet series that we did all year and, and, and all of us were, and Stephen at the university in Buffalo, they, we, were, we were playing chair music all the time, but I think there was something special about coming to a beautiful place and having everything else cleared off the table and then just devoting yourselves to the rehearsals and then having fun together and meeting new people. And that certainly was different and, you know, very, um, as you might say, therapeutic. But um, certainly the, most of the people that came to play the festival were very experienced chamber music players. And that was one of the big qualifications was not just to get a great concert master of summer that just did solos and stuff, but to really, um, really have people that were understood the nature of chamber music. One of the issues um, in the early years is, I think every summer it was before uh, Jim finally came on board, um, Jim Kennedy, that we we're always looking for cellists and uh, came to mind uh, the other night, uh, I was watching, uh, zooming, uh, always a New York Philharmonic string quartet. And there was Carter Bray, Playing mm -hmm. cello, and he's been principal in, in the New York Philharmonic. And Carter yeah. came early when he was a young fellow, and I think because of 
you know, there was always connections. And I think this was because Paul Wolf right. That's right. And the festival in Florida and, and Carter had been there. And he, also- he, he played in Paul Wolf's quartet. They played in the quartet together. Yeah. yeah. Carter. And then there was also, uh, I think the preceding summer was Timothy Eddy, who's became <laughs> That's a right. yep. you know, well-known cellist. So, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and we've had, you know, with, uh, I remember clarinetist David Schifrin. I mean, some really top name people over the years. Just within the first five years, all of these people. And I had a funny story about the Carter Bray thing too. Um, Homer had asked us um, if we wanted to play, I think maybe three concerts. And we sort of, um, my uh, Jim and I would, came to Maine and we had lots of projects on our property and we kind of coveted our time in Maine and we did a lot of chamber music during the year and we weren't sure we wanted to give up three weeks of our summer. So we said we'd do two, but we came to the concert. We were the last two weeks and we came to the, the concert was right before us. And um, I think maybe you were playing Stephen or maybe it was Frida, but it was the Trout Quintet and Carter Bray was playing. And um, I don't remember who else, but we came out of that concert and we looked at each other and says, whoa, we better go home and practice more <laughs> because, you know, we didn't know what we were getting into really that, that, you know, that it was going to be, you know, really, really high class um, people. So um, that, you know, that all, oh, that's the kind of thing that brings more people and keeps people coming back. I, I'm curious about this question. Um, as I was thinking about the history of this uh, festival, and the collection, the large now population of musicians who at one time or another were part of it. <clears throat> Between the three directors, who if we put it all together cover at least, it would seem almost 40 years, if not slightly more than 40 years of the festival's history. How has the repertory evolved, would you say? The nature of it, the variety of it, the chronological span of it, any thoughts? Go ahead. Yes. Um, I, I saw that you had proposed this question that we might talk about, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I went back and studied the early programs, thought about the programs that I had played in, and that, that and right up to today, the programs that are being, and I don't think it's changed very much. I don't mean to say the repertoire hasn't changed, but I don't think the type of repertoire and the way it's put together, I think Homer started it, he had the right idea, and Stephen and Frida went right along, and Homer was my, I've always told him he was my guide guidepost through every season that I, I always thought of Homer every season to make sure that we kept the same kind of, the only thing I would say is that there used to be more Baroque music, and I would attribute that probably to, there was a harpsichordist, Audrey Green, Audley Green, who lived, um, in, um, I forget the name of the town, Homer, there, but it's up near North Waterford, near, near, near Bridgeton. And she, um, Homer, had brought her in to play, um, so we'd have harpsichord for Baroque music. And I think for quite a while, there was more Baroque music than there is now. But, um, and then of course, there was this Renaissance things that um, both Ilona Conbrick did some very early things and the Red, Red House Circus, very early music. But that's a big, that's a big chunk of, of history to cover and it gets bigger and bigger all the time. And so there's a lot of works that have been written before we were ever founded that we would be playing now. So in that way it's changed, but otherwise I think the principles are very similar. Yeah, Stephen. Uh, yeah, there was one um, issue uh, and that has to do with vocal chamber music. That was always, that was a problem because it, it was not and you know, and then we had Carol Rosenbluth, and, and of course Kay Knight. Uh, that was not generally very popular with the audiences. And, and, and in fact, eventually we lost Eric Rosenbluth because we we said that we wouldn't be able to have Carol sing, and so he he kind of withdrew then at that time from the yeah. festival, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And then later on, we had absolutely wonderful singers and who both who have had uh, international careers, two different women. And, and I, 
for me, I mean, I just love wonderful singers and it was so hard for me to understand why our audience didn't react. But I think in some ways that the halls that we played in were, were not uh, kind of spacious enough or didn't have the right kind of acoustics to, because the singers were always seemed to be sort of overpowering, a good singer. And, and I think that maybe that's the only thing that I could think of, because I know there are people that love opera and love to go to the Metropolitan Opera broadcast, um, you know, but I, but I don't really know. We had wonderful singers. It wasn't, it wasn't because we didn't have good singers because Alona Combrook was wonderful, but that's just something that, that we discovered. Well, I, that, uh, an obvious explanation, not necessarily a correct one, is that I suspect for many audience members, at least in the time we've been going and there have been presentations of art song, uh, if not off-putting, at least disorienting, is the fact that the, the text is sung in a foreign language. Uh, and some may find that a bit uh, intimidating. Mm. They shouldn't, and I'm not defending that position mm. wholeheartedly, but thinking of possible explanations. Because it seems to me the current venue, Deer Tree Theater, would be ideal for uh, solo vocal music. And so for but whatever it reason, yeah, but it wasn't exactly solo vocal music because it wasn't like we had vocal and piano. We had small instrumental yeah. groups, yeah. except when we did the version of the Mahler Fourth Symphony. And then and then we had Lisa Saffer, who's <laughs> had played sung all over the world and all kinds of honors and operas and Mahler symphonies. And I don't know. I really don't know. What do you think, Barbara? You were you were you're an audience member and a board member. Well, I like it the way I liked it. I liked having the singers, and I liked it when uh, Elliot Balin's daughter sang when we did the Jewish. We had the whole. How many years ago was that when we had the Holocaust program, and Elliot played the piano, okay. and their daughter I forgot her name. Twenty fifteen. Yeah, twenty fifteen. I mean, that was a lovely, very. It, that was really very nice. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think um, I just like the chamber music more. And vocal go, belongs somewhere else to me, but I wouldn't ever vote against someone that's really good coming. This re brings me to another topic. Um, you talked about the audience not caring as much for vocal chamber music as instrumental chamber music. How do you know? How did you know? How did you gauge or get any kind of uh, audience response? People come up to you at the end of the evening and I, ideally not vent, but at least express. I had people come up to me at the beach and say, you know, we like your concerts, but we don't like those vocals. <laughs> now, these may not have been the most sophisticated chamber music listeners, but they were very supportive of sure. one, one part of the festival, but they didn't like those vocals. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was uh, tough. I I was very happy, actually. Well, not happy, but uh, I feel like I dodged a bullet because the um, problem with uh, Eric Rosenblith and his wife Carol um, fell on Stephen Frieda's shoulders and not mine. I managed to get through that first ten years without uh, doing it. The other thing was uh, Kay Knight, for example, who was a, a, a graduate with a vocal degree from Eastman. She'd had very good training, but had spent a lot of her recent years with dance music, probably was not at the level of say, Ilona Combrig, certainly. Um, and yet she was one of the founders and contributed a great deal to the festival. And I felt it was not inappropriate for her to uh, contribute to the programs. I remember she did Shepherd on a Rock uh, with Carm, I think, maybe. Um, that would be Carmelo Galante. Artist, but, uh, oh. and, and, you know, and she, she did several, several things. But it, it was a problem with, uh, with some of the folks. Uh, just didn't really go for that. Stephen? 
I, I want to get off the subject of music for a moment and talk about those early years, because one of the one of the things that we did out on that big sixty yard acres was have softball games, <laughs> and that was a big thing that we did. And we had, I think, what was it, barbecues and uh, we had a bad bit, and, uh, yeah. And that was one of the fun things. And, and of course, there were a lot of the young folks around then, you know, uh, your, your kids and our kids and, and Morris and Kay's the night kids. kids. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was also, a, you know, that was sort of a social aspect of, of, the, of the whole thing, but, but a very significant part. We always laughed about the softball games. Besides the musicians, we had theologians. You know, there's quite a little uh, theology contingent, or there was uh, here. And uh, so we had theologians, we had dentists and doctors, <laughs> and uh, I, I've forgotten who specifically, but it was a really neat mix of, of uh, musicians with town folks something we always enjoyed. Um, and the other thing, uh, of course, for particularly for my family was housing <laughs> and the number of different places that we stayed. I remember our first summer, there was uh, this dentist, Ron Hatch, up, uh, it was Upper Ridge Road and we stayed in his place because he had a summer place. And then uh, I forget a second, then there was a a farmhouse out uh, near Waters, was South Waterford. And then, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, it was the second or third summer we were up on Knights Hill. And it, it was only after several years that we finally settled for a number, many years. And, the, uh, the, um, and that brings up some founders or early mm -hmm. founders, uh, Leonard and Helen Scheinman and their compound down in Naples. And, and we stayed there for many summers until- If Leonard, uh, they if Leonard had had his way, we would have had three concerts a week minimum. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Leonard could never get enough chamber music. Uh, he was a wonderful contributor in, in that way. <laughs> I mean, housing as well as support. <clears throat> and uh, then, uh, Eventually, we ended up staying with uh, Jim and Laurie in that farmhouse out in uh, the Greens. Uh, yeah, North, North Waterford. The Ferry Cottage, right? The yeah. Ferry Cottage, the yeah. Greens. Well, the the no, Warren farm, was... the Warren the farmhouse, the Warren the Warren farmhouse. Yeah, same family. Well, Chris, yeah, Chris, you had asked about you know some of the uh, obstacles uh, and. Yeah. Just to think of housing all those musicians, and in many cases, we provided meals and so forth, but um, that also brought uh, people from the town um, into the planning and helping because contributing <laughs> housing. Uh, that farmhouse that Steve mentioned belonged to a Dr. White. If you are familiar with Thomas Mosier's furniture, one of the uh, prize pieces in his catalog is Dr. White's chest, I think it's called. And it was that Dr. White and his lovely wife that contributed that place. So that, that brought uh, problems sometimes finding housing, but it also introduced us to a lot of different people in the greater community. So yeah. a lot of times in the earlier years when Lori and Jim's kids were young and ours were young, the day after one of the concerts, we would decide to go on a canoe trip. And Lori's brother, Steve, came and I went with our sons, Andrew and Bradley, and Lori came with Julia and, and hey. anyway, and, then, hey. and, the white, and the Whites came and Paul, yeah. Paul um, Wolf and Doris came. Yeah. And what I wanted to tell the story one year going down the Saco River, we'd meet in the morning at 730 and be canoe all day long. We'd all gather different foods and share them. But we'd get in our canoes and Paul Wolf and Doris and I were in the same canoe sometimes. Our kids were alone, but he would sit in the middle of the canoe with his white gloves on. He would bring his boom box 
that had the concert from the night before all record taped. <laughs> and as we floated down the Saco River for like five hours, we would be listening to the concert that we heard the night before. And I'll never forget that. It was so much fun. And Lori and Jim brought their dog. And we, the kids were like seven and 10, our, our kids, same ages as, as Laura, Lori, Lori's kids. And it was sort of, well, sort of like a Rhine journey. Yeah, yes. <laughs> too, that so much of the camaraderie at the festival that's so important to me, my whole yeah. time they've been there since the eighties is that the music is fabulous. You, but you enjoyed their faces showed all of you that you really enjoyed each other and if, and when you enjoy not only the music but you look at each as, as you look at each other when you're playing still still it just it tra trans it just goes into all of the audience and everyone goes home grinning and feeling happy and that's one of the one of my th things that i really love about it another night was when the lights went out and my sisters were there and we all everyone grabbed flashlights <laughs> stage remember that Lori? were you there homer Coleman i think i was turning i was turning pages you were turning pages or steve or frida yeah i think uh, i was playing brahms quintet or something yeah yeah i think so yeah it was it was a brahms piano quintet and it's the only concert that jim's parents in all the years we played there that was the and they they were in maine in the summer over on the coast the only concert they ever came to they would never come back again because oh that's that festival where the lights go out <laughs> I remember Bridgeton Academy. Happened, the other one, the, the Bridgeton Academy, when um, something happened with the fire alarm system, is when <gasps> in, in late '80s, because I was still really new to being um, with the festival, and the fire alarm would go off, and we'd all go out and stand, sit in the yard, and they get it, would turn it off, and you go back in. It did that three or four weeks in a row. Do you remember that? Well, it it was actually the early '90s because early we 90s. were at the we were at the high school down in um you know the the lakes region high school yeah, Naples, uh, for Naples. two summers in 88 and 89 uh, because the bridge academy was being renovated and when we came back not only had they taken out our wonderful fan that had been contributed by an um, audience member that would kept things cooler they had also um oh they replaced the was it they they took out the pews and put chairs in or one thing or the other. No, it was the other and way around. Other yeah. way around, they put pews in and they carpeted the whole place. And so not only were the, were the acoustics, which were so nice before they were really deadened, but also they had this malfunctioning fire alarm system. And it not only did it go on for one summer, it went on for at least two summers. And I remember the last concert of that 1990, one or two concert, whatever it is, we did Schoenberg's Fair, Claire to Knocked. It's all about the moonlight and all this stuff and it gets all wound up in the middle and then you get back to the moonlight. And just as we were doing like the last page of this quiet music, it was, meh, 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 and everybody had to leave. It was the last, uh, the last page of the concert. And, and that was it, you know, we couldn't, I don't think we had got to finish the concert and that was so just, disappointing because that piece is, is difficult to put together and it's so emotional and <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, um, about certain works of instrumental chamber music that may have prompted strong reactions from audience members um, I'm thinking you mentioned uh, Feclet and Oct, that certainly would have Evolved. Well, it did something to the fire alarm system anyways. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, the I fire alarm was it regarded Sprechstimme as a yeah. threat, I suppose. I, I um, don't think that, I don't think that that would be, I think that that it's, for one thing, it's such early Schoenberg, it's very romantic. And yeah. it has such a, such a um, erotic story attached to it that of course was, you know, either told probably by me or maybe in the program notes or something. I don't think that one actually would. And I don't remember. We've done yeah. it several times, yeah. maybe at least three times. Yeah. But the one that I got it from was Shostakovich 8 String Quartet. And this was back at the Bridgeton Academy. So it was quite a long time ago. And that's the one that's, that's um, about, um, it's a real war, war piece yeah. and a, an angry, um, uh, it's the most kind of angry Shostakovich, but such a powerful expression. And so many people said to me, oh, it was just so, it just was so, um, you know, 
pictorial and it was so uh, really got right into your bones. But this one woman wrote me a note, you know, this elegant handwriting said, it's, it's terrible that, you know, that the Second World War and the Holocaust happened, but, you know, we don't want to have our lovely summer Tuesday nights ruined by it. And I just, I just thought, well, I'm just going to ignore that one. Yes, yes. I, I'd be curious to know what the reaction was when the festival performed George Crumb's trio, Vox Belini. Oh, does anybody um, recall the, the, the voices of the whale? Yes. Oh, the, oh, people love that. Good. People really love that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. They really loved it. And it's, it's, I think it's just partly just the, um, you know, all the stuff going on in the piano and the, you know, getting over the piano to fix this and that and to, oh. but also the, the, the eerie, you know, the lighting the, and the masking. and. Oh yeah. And, and yeah, I, I think that that was um, very well received as I remember. I enjoyed I it. I think that was that still at British Academy or was that over Deer Trees? No, no, that was at Deer Trees. It was at Deer Trees. Yeah. yeah. Well, that would have been even better at Deer Trees. Yeah. The, these stories are wonderful, together. and they bring me to a, a point of <laughs> wanting to ask, because it's quite clear that this happened. But at what point did you sense, those of you who are involved, that the festival had put down roots deep enough in the, what shall we call it, the cultural soil of Western Maine, for want of a better metaphor, um, that uh, it was clear it could continue from year to year, uh, obviously requiring a dedicated leadership, um, but it could be here to stay. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I think Laurie's holding up that first annual. Um, one of the things that uh, happened, I think I had submitted an article of some sort to the Bridgeton News or perhaps one of the Portland papers uh, talking about uh, bringing fine music to the area, uh, North Bridgeton and Harrison and so forth. And I got a phone call from Mona Irish. Mona was the wife of the postmaster in Harrison. And Mona was the church organist, I think, at the Congregational Church here in town and had been very active in the late 30s and early 40s when uh, there was a, quite a large summer musical community here, somewhat associated with deer trees, but really not, um, I wish I could remember the mentor's name there that uh, anyway, it was, it dealt mostly with vocal music and so on, uh, operatic music. But Mona gave me quite a lecture on, listen here, young man, uh, you don't believe that you're the first or uh, the foremost here, but Harrison's been a fine musical community, blah, 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 and so forth and so on. So I got, um, I, I, I got my feathers trimmed fairly early there about thinking that what we were doing was unique or special. Uh, it was in that for many years, not much had happened musically. Emerson College had put on a few shows when they ran Deer Trees, but other than that, um, perhaps just the occasional concert but there had been quite a tradition in Harrison of music and music study and fine musicians coming here. So. Good. Good to know. But, but, but I, I, I think once that first year, um, once we had the, those first concerts out of the way, we realized that there was definitely an audience and there wasn't much question about that. And we just had to keep up the standards. And, and I think very important too, um, in those first four concerts, each one of them, Homer brought in an organization from the surroundings. We talked about the Red, Red Circus in the first one. And in the second one, it was, I have to look it up here because I did a little research. It was the Summit Hill Players who were already your group but you were, you know, taking a little highlight there. And in the third one, it was, um, Portland I think this, Quartet. 
maybe? Uh, the Portland String Quartet was one of them. I don't think it was the third one. It was, um, um, oh, where did it, when I'm getting, getting off here. Oh, it was, um, it was the um, L'Histoire du Soldat with the Theater of the Mom Myth. The Theater so of Mom Myth. Yeah. yeah, there were actors and, um, and um, Paul Vermel came in as the conductor and he was the former, wonderful former conductor of the Portland Symphony, who is just uh, really a really fine, fine artist and conductor. And um, so they had a stage production from Monmouth that was just in 75. And then in 76, um, well, let's see. Um, they there was the um, Lake Region Madrigal Singers, and there was a whole little with narration by Steve Collins, and <laughs> so there was a lot. And there was the Portland String Quartet. Maybe it was in addition to one of these other things, one of these other summer things. Uh, but I did see that too, and, it was and that early. was that was really a great way of bringing the community in and saying it's not just about us, it's about the whole area. So, so the woman who, you know, well, you're not the only thing around. I mean, she really hadn't gotten that, that um, memo yet that the Sebago Luck was going to be a very inclusive organization. <laughs> I think the Portland String Quartet came in uh, the second, second or third summer. Okay, you, you I'll look it up. Got them all them right them, here. Stephen. So you, you did a piece and Judy did the Mozart. Exactly right. Well, I, I did uh, I, think I don't remember what you yeah, did. It was, it was the second season, right. Yeah, that's what I yeah. thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christopher, one, one of the questions uh, I know you, you had posed had to do with outreach. And we have yes, and I was wanting to get to that. So thank you. Take it away, Mr. Ennis. Well, I think Lori, I'll let Lori deal with that. Well, Homer started it um, by by cooperating with the other groups, and 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 I know that you started the youth programs, and that was maybe the second season or third. I, I have that yeah, too. Second, I think. Third, second or third. Yeah, children's conscience. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then um, I'm not I'm not sure how much, um, but I. Um, I felt, and it was once uh, uh, in the first few years that Jim and I were playing, we were only in Maine in the summers and we were still in Buffalo during the winters. So I didn't really start to get a feel for other things that were going on in Maine until we joined the Portland Symphony in 1981. And then we, um, we really, you know, I felt like, and I started getting to know people around the state that it was really important for us to and it was actually part of the original mission and stayed part of the mission. It was not chamber music at Deer Trees or Bridgeton Academy, whatever. It was providing music and music education for the people of Western Maine. And, um, and we certainly did that in so many different ways. The youth program extended to, you know, sometimes three or four concerts a summer in different areas. And I mean, I can't even list them all. I know we used to do them out in Freiburg and what was the name of that town hall where we did them Homer for a number of years up on the hill in Bridgeton, past the statue? Bridgeton. Um, the Bridgeton Town Hall, yeah. was it called? Yeah. You know, up on the, up on, um, as if you were going out to- um, Freiburg. If yeah, but private, there's a the there's a big old we you did you did concerts with us up there. It's yeah. a big old white building, and it's um um up just up past when when the middle of bridge when you go up the hill and there's sort of a monument and a turn off. Oh, in the it's, uh, that she's one. thinking of uh, yeah the hall there on the, Highland. Right. Uh, no. uh, what's I, I can't it remember was the name of Bridge it. Town it was like part of the, Town Hall. Yeah, you know, the Bridgeton Town Hall that was yeah. then, and I got. Um, yeah. So there were a couple of summers where I was in charge of getting these. Yeah. So I called Bridgeton Town Office yeah. and get the recreation department and we'd yeah. set a date. Yeah. And then Freiburg was at the Molly Ackett School and the kids right. would walk through the woods mm -hmm. from the Graustein Park and sit down with their little lunch boxes. And, and what was fun about that was that was when John Schnell was playing um, the trumpet with the symphony and was one of the players. It was such fun to have people, from, like Lori said, from all over. But the kids would sit and listen for about half an hour. And then they could get up and hold the trumpet and try to blow it. And then and Lori's <laughs> daughter, uh, Kate, played the cello. And my niece played her flute once, one of the Hastings yeah. girls from Freiburg. 
So there are concerts in Maliak at school, the Bridgeton one, and then we had two concerts at Dare Trees Theater that for youth and bus, buses came in from more the than yeah, camps. The, yep. camp, camps and rec the, programs yeah. and rec programs. The music for kids, that, 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 yeah. those were really important because a lot of those kids have gone on and done more with music and they sort of got the idea of what it is to hold an instrument and talk to these wonderful musicians and just be, in, and they've, so you, didn't you, uh, Homer, walk through everybody with your bassoon playing part of Peter and the Wolf and the yeah. kids could just see, <laughs> and, see you playing? And we did Peter, that. Peter and Wolf. We did Peter and Wolf uh, numerous yeah, times. Peter and the Wolf is always very, so I'll yeah. We, we awesome. had done uh, nursing really home programs too in the first few years. And Mickey Friedman had yeah. gotten us grants and she was interested in that area. And uh, so we, we took our music to um, several of the area nursing homes, which yeah. it, it's kind of a tough place to play, but um, it was always appreciated, I think. Yeah. And then the, the yeah. residential homes, we started going more to, you know, or, or now there are senior, senior communities or, um, and that's yeah. continued. But also we played uh, several summers at Bates College, several summers at USM, and at least 10 years at UMaine Farmington, um, where we were close to where I live and I knew a lot of people there and those concerts were, um, they'd be a repeat. Most of these college ones would be a repeat of the one that we'd done at either British Academy or, or um, Deer Trees. And I think we started the, we definitely started the UMaine concerts back in the eighties. I, I remember one particular one in 87. So I know it was that early. And that went on for many years. And in fact, when that stopped because of the way the college was funding things, that really set down the framework for another chamber music festival that I was involved with called Main Mountain Chamber Music oh, yeah. with my partner, Lily Funahashi. And that never would have gotten started if the festival hadn't put down those, um, you know, those first, the, those years of chip, get people getting used to coming to chamber music concerts in the summer. And then we and go over then, to Fry Freiburg a couple of times. Yep. Freiburg, the Performing Arts Center, we went over there at least for two summers. Mm -hmm. And um, and these were, and then many churches and synagogue um, in Auburn. So really there's just enormous number of, say nothing of Shabig Island. And the Shabig Island trip was once a summer, once we went twice. And that went probably for uh, close to 20 years. And that all started because this lovely gentleman came up to me at the Portland Symphony and said, would you know somebody I could talk to about having a chamber music concert on Shabig Island this summer? And I said, yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, well, my wife is having her you know, 60th birthday or something. She just loves chamber music. And I said, we'll be there now. What would you like to do? <laughs> and then so we went over and Mihe was with that group, I think, Mihe and Bill Purvis. And we were playing the Mozart horn quintet. It was in the little, a little sort of community center. And um, when we got to the cadenza, the horn cadenza in the um, Mozart horn quintet, Bill was off on the cadenza and all of a sudden it changed keys and Mihai and I are kind of looking at each other and suddenly it went into dum da dum bum 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 <laughs> and did the happy birthday and then back into the and you know that was very well received and um, that was a, a wonderful experience that we did for many summers take the ferry over with our instruments had ever ferry tickets and stayed in various people's homes and it just was um uh uh, another kind of outreach that many of the musicians enjoyed. Yeah, Stephen, you probably have um, other ones uh, too. Well, I was trying to remember early years. Didn't we go up to some, it was like a ski resort place in Maine and do something? Yeah. Uh, <gasps> I went to a concert. Bethel, it was in Bethel. Oh, Bethel. Oh, some that river. too, but no. Well, no, I went, no, it no? Was, okay, because uh, I went to that. No, it was farther was north. What, what's the big ski place? Oh, up it was north? probably up at Kingfield. At, um, Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf? No, yeah. Range, Range. Sugarloaf? Maybe Sugarloaf. Anyways. Um, Sunday River. No, it, it, Bethel. No, it wasn't Sunday River. It was still. Well, then the only other one is the Rangeley one. What's that called? The Rangeley one? I remember. Uh, it wasn't Rangeley, but that was another place we played was Rangeley. 
a couple of times. At Saddleback. We did, and we played at Bethel Academy, or uh, not Bethel Academy. That's, but, yeah. Gould What's Academy. Gould Academy. Gould. 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 Academy. Yeah. That's yeah, wasn't there a place in New Hampshire we played once? <laughs> we played lots of them. We played one in Connecticut, too. <laughs> So the the short answer to Christopher's question is yeah. that there, from the beginning, there has been uh, more or less continual uh, outreach, and and that continues to and, right the the, the present. Um, it's been something it'll, it'll, yeah. a hallmark of the festival, I think. And one of the things that's so wonderful, I remember I used to argue a bit with the board members because they would say, well, what is this for us? We're not getting any money from it. And, and we're paying musicians. And, and I always had to say, well, there usually was money, some money coming, perhaps not all of it, but we could get grants for doing outreach, which we did. We, we get to know new people. We get audience, especially if they're like little churches around in the area, new audience to come and new support and new donors. And so, you know, to me, it felt like, even though it was a lot of work in, and it was extra income for the musicians so that when they came, it wasn't just one concert at Deer Trees, we'd go around and do other ones. And it made it a little bit through the years as that became more of more importance, of more, a little more income for the musicians. Right. So it was very important, is very important to this day, yeah. And Homer started it all. I have to keep saying that all of what was we did, all the things that we did was just a continuation of what Homer did in those first first 10 years or the oh, first few years. So basically we can sum that up by saying it was all his fault. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful fault. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Any other reflections? The chamber music series is one of the more gratifying things that I've been involved in in my busy life up here in this corner of Maine. And I'm really happy to have been part of uh, helping it develop and find its sustenance. With good reason. The work has paid off, I think, very uh, well for the benefit of the community and the region. And I wanna thank you for your time and for your reflections. Well, you're very welcome. Well, uh, this has been wonderful. I thought I would have to do some prodding to get people to talk. Obviously, that was unnecessary. <laughs> and this made for a lovely conversation on a set of reminiscences. I have more questions, but um, I think the questions that I have can be saved for another occasion. Ms. Kennedy, you wish to speak? I, I just have to say that Barbara, Barbara should have something to say about this, but it never would have happened without a entirely dedicated volunteer board and uh, that is such an unusual thing for a, a festival of this size to get through 50 years without any kind of a paid like the music directors were paid a little bit more and more as it went on but um without any paid administrators it's all done by the volunteer board and barbara i think probably is the longest serving of them and powell also who passed away recently but Oh, did just she? tremendous yeah. dedication, de tremendous dedication from the board and from the kind of communication that we would have between board and music directors. And we Amen. enjoy doing yeah. it. We all love doing it too, because we believe in the festival and we don't want it to stop and to keep on going. My hair's getting gray over here, but. <laughs> Small price to pay. At least you have some hair. <laughs> yeah, I never have colored it. Anyway, that's not part of it. But um, it's really fabulous. It's a lot of work, and sometimes it's like, why am I still doing this? But then you go to the concert and you say, this is why I'm doing it. And the Shabrik concerts are back again, and they were doing one in Piper Shores. I mean, it's still going. Piper Shores for the first time, and Ocean View and Falmouth are, are having concerts. This is not the founders thing, but just to show it's all of these are continuing, and they're even more this year this year because of all the COVID years, we've really picked up a more concerts outreach, about 12. Wow, that's great. Yeah. No one's canoeing on the Saco after concerts. They're going right up to go to the next concert. <laughs> but I think this I has been great. I want to jump in at this point now and say that 
I've been very energized to hear your stories and very excited about the potential for the future of the music festival because this group is not going anywhere basically at the moment. And it's wonderful to um, get to know you and to look ahead to and celebrate, but first to celebrate the 50th anniversary, which is going to be a marvelous five season, um, a five concert series. And I know we're all looking forward to that. So at this point, I think we, need to close our session. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being willing to participate in this. And we'll see whether we can arrange some additional conversations, um, either one more before the actual series or something after the series. If there is an interest in that, please be thinking about your ideas because this is a work in progress. So with Thanks. that, I'll close and say you have heard the program today, which we have called the Festival Founders Tell Their Story, a conversation about the origins and history of the Sebago Long Lake Music Festival. Thank you all so much 